they just hired the same kind of like B plus corporate spy who just <laughs> stole his own work and sold it back to both companies. <laughs> yeah. boys here it's an ethan episode so you can probably guess that the internet's number one fake history podcast is going to be talking about warhammer D D, or magic the gathering this episode and it is the first one or one of the two first ones which is warhammer 40k specifically listeners of the show oh. will note that we're talking about the tau empire from warhammer 40k uh but my two co-hosts james and peter say hi james and peter hi james and peter Hi, James and Peter. Oh, wow. You guys you guys got full marks on that one. I'm, I'm proud it of you. It was for the greater good, wink. Oh, okay. So you know a bit about the Tao then. I do, yeah. yeah okay, perfect, perfect. Um, I... I've read the footnotes of a lot of the... Because we've covered so much Space Marine stuff, and I personally don't... You know, like, because they're so common and so ubiquitous, personally, when I do my own research on Warhammer stuff, I, like... like cancel out the the keyword space marine from all my searches and obviously paint the sisters so i yeah. i was curious about some of the other races as well so i've i've watched a little bit tau tau is one that so when i was a kid i had a tyranids army and um i played with some friends from in high school um we played 40k and i had a cousin who was really into warhammer fantasy at the time and he had a lizard men army and I got a, I had like two squads of goblins, essentially. Uh, but he always said if he got into 40k, he would he would have chosen the Tau. And that's like the limit of my knowledge of the Tau before I started writing this episode was oh, okay. the fact how they looked, that they looked kind of cool. Um, I did kind of have a broad strokes understanding of like the greater good and that they were like the best, uh, the the most goody two shoes of the uh, Warhammer 40k races. Um, I didn't, yeah. I didn't know to our, to what extent. Um, that, that I know that nothing. Was. Yeah, are they are they cow people? Uh, they might be cow people, but we we will get into the who and what what they are. Like uh, Tor, like Taurus, Torin. Oh, Taurus. Oh, I got, I got you, I got you. But no, yeah, but no, yeah, absolutely no. not. Uh, okay, you can yeah. probably milk them. It's not explicitly stated that they're mammalian, <laughs> but we're going to say Lore Voice Canon that they're mammalian and that they got okay. titties. I think yeah. Games Workshop makes it so you can milk every single character so they can milk you in return for all <laughs> yeah. of your money. Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. it's, it's, I, it, in it canon, is... I play Sisters of Battle, the only known milkable army. Okay, it's 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 strange <laughs> that we are talking about this because this was a point that I brought up during the show. There are uh, two recorded examples of female Tau at all, which, like, again, great job, Game Games Workshop. You eliminated women from your fantasy universe. Finally. Great, great. Uh, I, and I mean, I know a lot of uh, very horny, very neckbeardy Warhammer fans who might listen to our show will hear that and be like, well, it's a man's universe because it's grimdark. Uh, but at the same time, <laughs> fuck you and stop listening to our show. Um, I've got the Sisters of Battle. They, they, they're they like the most psychotic and hardcore uh, out of all of them. That's that's just as grim. Yeah, yeah. Uh, again, just, just more recent, like the fact that there's no space marines that are that are female or, or women it's it's always like oh you get your own sect where uh you can go have your period off in peace you know and you'd be the sisters, sisters of, of violence right yeah i mean yeah i mean there's there's the there's sex that they've created since then but uh i mean it is very very cashed in uh 80s and and before um yeah you know when when games workshop first created warhammer but uh the i, I was gonna bring up the fact eventually that there's only two recorded women in the tau race <laughs> when uh we'll get into it any species can be tau essentially but there's only two women thank you very oh, much oh <laughs> yeah that's true ever like you kept referring them to a sect it, women the sex that get their own sect like <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> the sex with a sect women what's all about them i think i i watched a video uh from a much much larger channel called bricky which was like I don't know, like an hour long that I watched in sections when I was painting. In where he sections? Spent like, I heard it too. In sections. <laughs> yeah, Jamie in made the eyebrows. Sections. <laughs> and I, exactly. I hopped on it. <laughs> uh, which was he spent like 10 minutes kind of giving you the spark notes of every army and every race in 40K, which is where I 
the first time I learned about my own army and then like the Tau and all the different Space Marine chapters and, and shit like that. Yeah. Um, I guess for people who've never listened to a Warhammer 40k episode of our show before, um, this is the first for this particular race. And this race, I don't think we've brushed up against in any other episode. So this is a great starting episode for anybody who's like, what's 40k about? Um, that said, we won't talk about what we might talk about on this episode, things like the warp and the Immaterium. Uh, I think that's, and the Space Marines, um, which are the only other things from the Warhammer canon that we talk about. Um, but it's probably a decent starting point. If you like, uh, this episode, you'll probably like other 40k episodes of which we have plenty. I I would say, I would say more than enough, maybe so much that this would be the last ever 40k episode. Can you have a sword behind you in the corner? Sorry. No, I was going to ask you the same thing because your mic arm looks like a sword. (laughs) Oh, man. (laughs) I'm looking, yeah, behind your lamp. It looks like there's a sword resting against the wall. It does look like there's a sword resting against the wall in Peace Department. That is a lacrosse stick from the Russian lacrosse team. When my mom Uh, used to work for the Montreal Gazette, we got good seats. It's like one of those canes that has a sword inside, but it's a lacrosse stick. (laughs) it's It's a lacrosse stick without the net. So at the end of the game, um, because we were kids sitting in the box, like close to the pitch or whatever the fuck, the field, um, the lacrosse rink, um, yeah. the, the, <laughs> the coach for the Russian team, the court, the uh, lacrosse court, exactly. Yeah. Uh, through like the panel to where like the team was sitting, handed me and my sister lacrosse sticks and balls from the game. Cause this one's got a dent in it. It's damaged. So he, he just gave them to the kids sitting next to the box. So I got oh, that, cute. uh, fuck it. Like in 2000 or something. Wow. My brother has a uh, goalie stick signed by Marty Brodeur from when he was playing. Uh, he played a, a game for the farm team one year. And we went. To, we used to go to farm team games because a friend of my parents had season yeah. tickets to the uh, Hamilton Bulldogs. Well, I, I collected all the toenail clippings outside um, the Stanley Cup arena. <laughs> and uh, they're, they're pretty great. I don't know whose they are, but they've got to be worth something. Uh, they <laughs> They might have been mine, or they might have been Patrick Waz. We were both fans of clipping our toenails outside the Stanley Cup Arena. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so you guys want to you guys want to talk about some lore? You guys want to you guys want to get into it? We are we are kind of thumbing our noses at um, Games Workshop with all the litigation that they've been going at recently, and I had some yeah. I had some uh, some doubt about doing more Warhammer content because I was like, do I want to? It does feel like we're promoting them. And it's like, do I want to keep promoting a company that's been so shitty to the people that create for it? Um, if they come after us, then we'll just never do another piece of Games Workshop content at that point, right? But I think I think it's worth it because there is some part of me that is just like when the corporation goes after the little guy, sometimes the little guy can get a boost. So I would very <laughs> much like to lift my okay. shirt up over my head and smack my stomach in front of the Games Workshop. Or, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, metaphorically, basically, just metaphorically, like, come and fucking get me, you and cowards. Literally. Okay, so if they, if they sue us and we suddenly get an influx of money and our patrons supporting us through, um, through donations to fight the Games Workshop litigation machine, then we will yeah. literally, and this is Lord Boy's Canon, and we will literally go to England, take off our shirts, and slap our belly outside of the Games Workshop headquarters. Uh, yeah, yeah, the- yeah, exactly. <laughs> we'll, we'll have like lore boys here, written across the three of our chests, and we'll just like 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 apes, basically. Stomachs <laughs> in front of the game. What if we just start our own company called like Germs Workshop or something like that? <laughs> <laughs> And, then, and just like rename everything just a little bit different, just, but use the same yeah, lore. Just yeah. games work shit. Like, just, <laughs> uh, we'll charge we'll charge a thousand dollars for one model, and it'll be a shitty sculpted model by me. Pete, Pete's not allowed anywhere near the design of this thing. Okay, All right. it, it's gonna be Samus with a shittily photoshopped piece of corn on her arm. <laughs> you know, what? I'll make the paint, and we'll throw it in for free if you've spent a thousand dollars on a figure. Yeah. Yeah. I'll, yeah, I'll make the paint is the most bold statement we have ever made on this show because i have no clue how to make paint (laughs) yeah just not i think you just you put color in water in a jar and you shake it up real good i'm pretty sure just shake it enough there you go can can (laughs) and a label and then you see those machines the Uh, machines make it into paint right uh yeah they just shake it to shake it to paint that's that's the that's the key it's like milk into whipped cream yeah (laughs) (laughs) so the Tau. 
<laughs> Sorry, I'm just now I'm imagining like an old timey like churning butter, like the churning a paint churner, <laughs> bucket, but like a yeah, exactly like a woman from the 1700s churning yeah. paint. I'm I, wearing a corset and holding my gut in as uh, best as I can yeah, in it. front of Games Workshop. Yeah, yeah. Obviously, damn it, damn it, wench! I need that purple paint with which to dye my cloak. What yeah. holds holds thee? <laughs> oh God! Uh, cool. Okay. What's, what's a Tau? I don't even know, man. The Tau yeah. are a young humanoid species from the Milky Way, known for their huge leaps in technological advancement. They sport massive mechs clad in cool, smooth-edged white metals. Um, yeah. Pete, you have some familiarity. Do you want to take a crack at describing their look, their kind of aesthetic? Uh, yeah, so the Tau themselves, the race, are totally humanoid as far as I know. Two legs, two arms, one head. Uh, nipples unknown, what with the whole... There's, unmilkable as far as we know <laughs> uh but they do have like flat faces they don't have noses they just have nostrils, no noses. right no noses they're kind of like the closest thing they're basically kind of like like a classic stereotypical alien but with like a more jacked physique where they they have like a soldier's body uh and their technology is all very smooth and angular um it's very kind of anime inspired so well i mean i guess not if you're talking about like evangelion mechs or Gurren lagan or whatever yeah but very gundam very like flat edges and very um very sci-fi compared to a lot of the rest of the 40k shit which tends to be much more pointy and stumpy like the the space marine tanks are pretty much just like a box with a cannon on it yeah and, and we'll right. we'll get into the we'll get into the grim or like how why the tower are considered like the goody two shoes, which is something that I said before of the Warhammer forty k grim dark universe. Um, but I mean, you pretty much nailed it. They they use like they're known for their high technology. They're like super techie. They use like battle mechs, like walkers. They don't really have traditional tanks. Uh, high powered sniper rifles look more like the beam cannon from uh, Halo three than the uh, marine ODST sniper rifle from Halo three, yeah. essentially. Um, so they are. I looked them up too. They right. look like Gundam Wing and stuff like that. Yeah. And I clicked on one, which appears to be the size, like as tall as your thumb, and it's seventy five dollars. Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> like, oh, like sounds, the Imperial sounds... Knights. The Imperial <laughs> yeah. Knights from the Imperium have a lot of like furnace looking technology and a lot of exposed metal and and pistons and shit. Where like yeah. pretty much all the technology is armored or covered up by like flat panels with the tower. They're cleaner sci-fi yeah much, oh. more star, much more star trek i guess but like if it was walking yeah i would almost say the um the eldar are kind of like uh the other end of if you if you take a spectrum between the uh, imperium of man and the eldar which we've done an episode on or we've done an episode on both of them um but you can google them both the tau kind of land somewhere in the middle where the eldar kind of have these like large sweeping uh sci-fi aesthetic but they also border very much into the fantasy aesthetic as well where they have kind of like these these headdresses that, that go up like really high and have like all these like they're very ornamental the tower very functional in their look where um it's just like armor and you know uh, rounded to deflect bullets rather than bear the brunt of them that kind of thing but they keep the high fantasy where there's no women allowed at least <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. At <laughs> least. yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> at least um so fellowship the, in the ring come on yeah <laughs> no, no women allowed <laughs> Except for one yeah. who saves Frodo, Frodo's life, and one who threatens him. Very scary. Uh, <laughs> while the while the Tower are willing to fight to expand their interstellar empire, they do claim to be peaceful when possible, giving potential enemies the chance to avoid combat by joining the Tauva, which is their dogmatic system, which Peter referenced before, the greater good. Um, they kind of believe in this, this system of everything they do is to minimize conflict and strife and... Uh, upsetty spaghetti, uh, and they just want everyone to be happy and lovey, and th they're the most socialist, I'd say, probably of the of the races. Peter, I have a question. Yes, uh, this is setting off a lot of red flags for me. Uh, the 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 greater good is something that we have often lampooned on this show, as yeah. the greater good is obviously the pavement for that road to hell more than anything. So it's probably kind of good on the surface, is my guess. Yeah, so uh, we're, we're, we're going to get into it for sure. It does seem like the original intent was to be socialist utopia. Yeah. And I, I kind of referenced it before, but the uh, horny, neckbeardy uh, Games Workshop fans, myself included, uh, <laughs> didn't didn't take kindly to it not fitting the grimdark setting. Was this socialist utopia? Uh, 
Okay. So we'll we'll get into it. it. It's not actually canon one way or another, or it's it's canon both ways. I I couldn't find what the currently accepted canon is that isn't the fan canon. Like oh, all the fans agree that it's this way. I found that no problem, but I couldn't find like an official statement on hey, this is how we intended this to be kind of thing. So by the way, if you do donate to the Lore Boys Patreon, it is for the greater good. And always, it, always, it, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. trust us yeah. about that. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> it's for the greater good to get women out of podcasting or something. I don't know. <laughs> Jesus, <laughs> what is that bad? Am I not allowed to say that? Damn, twenty twenty one really well, blindsided me. <laughs> we got a we we got a knockout call me da- call her daddy or whatever before we can get to Joe Rogan. So we do need to get her out of the way before we take her on top dog sure. and kill him. <laughs> so uh, they are the Tau expand throughout the the solar system or their solar systems the, throughout the galaxy. Um, and are, are preaching the, the greater good. But the backup to missionaries is, of course, high-powered lasers capable of vaporizing flesh and bone. Uh, so they are willing to scrap when they need to. If you don't accept yeah. the greater good, then, hey, we're going to go to war with you to make you accept the greater good, basically. We're going to put our people on your planet in place of you, kind of thing. Yep. I mean, uh, that, that's a greater good from the perspective of the winner, I suppose. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, Peter, you did a great job descri- describing the uh, physical characteristics of the what you think are the Tau with the no noses and the wide faces and blah blah blah. Um, so a fun distinction about the Tau, probably as a result of their willingness to let others join them rather than be destroyed, is that they are truly a culture over a single species. When when we talk about the Tau, we're talking about a culture or a dogma more than we're talking about a species. Uh, so the species that you described are the Crut, the ones with the blue skin and the oh, the slit okay. nose. Um, those are considered the Crut. Um, there's several intelligent species that make up the Tau. They're primarily comprised of the species known as the Crute, the Vespids, and the Nikasar are the the three like predominant Tau races that you see. Primarily, not exclusively, of course. There, so, for example, there are human Tau. Uh, you can be a human and be a Tau as well. Uh, large groups of conquered humans or voluntary converts who were impressed by the Tauva, um, the greater good, okay. the concept of yeah. greater good. Uh, the humans, uh, in particular, are known as the Gevasa, uh, a fittingly condescending title which translates literally to human helper. <laughs> <laughs> which was, you know what, Aunt uh, Betty or whatever the fuck makes, Betty Crocker, yeah. that one was a little <laughs> too far. <laughs> That's a... Uh... When, that when, was Aunt, a little too when Aunt Jemima met, met he better, Mary Betty Crocker and produced the yeah. Gavasa. <laughs> <laughs> human helper. No, yeah. thank you. Yeah, no, yeah. thank you. You, you, I mean, you I, pushed I, it with Asian helper, but human helper? No, thanks. I don't think so. <laughs> Not all of us. <laughs> I think I'd probably be okay with the greater good if my if my options were living in a dusty gutter and on like a Martian factory city or like join some shinier aliens. I'd probably go for that. I mean, it's it's a particularly interesting concept in the 40k universe where everything is bad all the time, and that's like the yeah. the driving principle behind the um, 40k universe. For like to illuminate the point, uh, people the Gevasa who join the uh, Tau are considered traitors, most vile, and straight up heretics by the Imperium of Man. Like, yeah, well, they're hanging out with Xenos. I would totally understand ex- how that is. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. You you joined a filthy Xenos race in the in the search for a better life. Fuck you. We're gonna kill you. If we, we're chain sorting you the next time we see you. Basically, yeah. <laughs> is uh, how the Imperial Man feels about it. I will kill you if you speak to those evil things over there. It's like, <laughs> wait a second. I'm getting mixed messages here. <laughs> So for the for the three races that make up the proto Tau species, we're going to talk pr- primarily about the Crute or what I I believe are the Crute. I didn't look at all the races that make them up, but the three primary races, the Crute are the ones that you see, like Peter described and said, like oh blue skin, blue gray skin, kind of you know whatever. Uh, That's so, the main figurines that you can buy is like I'm more familiar with the toys than than anything else. Yeah, you can get certain like groups which will be made up of. Vespids, which will be made up of Nikasar. Uh, I'm super glad, Pete, that you described the Crute because that's what we're going to talk about primarily as the okay. Tau or the Proto Tau, essentially. Okay. Are Vespids like bug men? They are, actually. I I'm, yeah. don't know how you knew that, but uh, I'm, gla- it, it, I'm glad. The, you the entire, I think the entire species of like wasps, bees, and ants are all Vespids, as far as I know. Oh, uh, that might make sense, yeah. actually. That rang true for me from other games too. I, I think that they've I've seen other bug enemies called like Vess whatever the fucks. So yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean we'll we'll get into 
we're, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna go off on it. I'll, I'll say one short thing about the Vespids near the end of the episode, I think, or maybe okay. closer to the end of the episode. But for now, we'll talk about the um, the Crute. I'm gonna describe them as Tau for the most part. Um, but each Tau's or each Crute's physiology seems to be tied to their position in the Tau cast system. So uh, they're big on assigned roles in a society. They're a true socialist utopia where everyone gets a job and that's the job that you do and you do it well kind of thing. And like you get a job that that you respond to well and you're literally biologically designed for in the case of the Tau. Like you're you're designed for this. The, um, you know, the worker class tends to be shorter and stouter. The And we'll get into the different caste systems, but like, the cast that works in spaceships literally can no longer survive in gravity, essentially. So, oh, um, it's really like socialist utopia, a la Max, taken to its extremes. Um, they are broken into five. It seems like many of the sub races are a result of the environment or col- colony world they are orig- they were originally on. Uh, a more Darwinian approach to evolution, maybe. Um, but they come closer and closer for a while. They kind of uh, converge to a point and then the ruling class of Tau bans interbreeding between the castes. So now they are they've stopped, you know, uh muddying the waters and they're big fans of eugenics and they're saying like we're going to keep the caste systems as they are because they're good at what they do. We don't yeah. want our spaceship faring uh people who who can't handle gravity mixing with our people who build brick houses because you're going to produce a child that you're going to produce a lot of children who can do neither of both. You know, maybe I'll produce well, some neither children. Both, neither both well, because if, you, exactly. if your bones are slightly brittle because you're not good at dad bricks. is an engineer, right? <laughs> and, but and your mom is, you know, like a husky bitch who can like lift whatever she needs. Yeah. Uh, then you're just going to be kind of like an in-between and maybe you can build a shed, but nobody really needs that anymore sort of thing. My yeah. dog's mom was a husky bitch. <laughs> that is true. <laughs> that is true. Um, yeah, I, we won't get into the Lore Boys canon of eugenics on this episode, I don't think, but uh, like whether or not it's whether or not it's good or bad. But that... we got an episode about eugenics coming. Don't worry. <laughs> but Lore Boys here talking about your favorite topic, eugenics. Like, <laughs> yeah. oh my god, yikes! <laughs> Who should you marry and why? <laughs> <laughs> Wait, is it not the study of Eugene, my friend from uh, primary school? God damn. <laughs> It's whether or not Eugene can have kids. Yes. Oh, okay. Yes. <laughs> okay. I I would say no, and I think I'm entitled to that right. Uh, <laughs> okay. So <laughs> the uh, the Crutes, um, they look, in my opinion, a lot like the Protoss in Starcraft. Uh, Blue gray skin, hoofed feet with the reverse knee joint, often in large plated armor, usually depicted in like beige or gold. Um, wide flat faces with just a slit where a human nose would be. There's not too much separating them from humans besides some superior color vision. Their visual spectrum extends slightly further than ours in the ultraviolet and infrared lengths. Um, and they're also worse in some respects that uh, they can't see their focus at, at long distance isn't quite as good without the aid of technology and things like that. Okay. Now, I know we, we've given Blizzard a lot of grief for stealing IPs. And one we've done before on the in the past on this show for sure is the Terran Marine design from uh 40 the 40k ultramarine yeah it does seem like the tau design and the protoss design actually came about at the same time they look super similar if you look up a zealot and you look up a tau like a zealot from starcraft 2 particularly um it does look they do look very similar but it does seem like they came about the same time so the crew like I said, which make up the primary of the Tau races, were first introduced as a playable race. So the Tau became a race in 2001, which is three years after the release of StarCraft, yeah. which, which came out in 19, 1998. But in 1998, Games Workshop released the third edition Warhammer 40k rulebook where the crew were first depicted as a other dangerous alien races, essentially. So uh, in 1998, StarCraft was released and Games Workshop for the first time that same year produced a hey these are other races that you should watch out for but they they released it in march of 1998 so relatively early like not enough time to get to print and having seen you know starcraft for the first time and saying like oh we're gonna have those people in our game it does seem like this is convergent development of two practically identical alien races so knowing blizzard and games workshop i'm inclined to believe that they both stole them from the same source somewhere else (laughs) but yeah (laughs) where that was i i didn't look into i didn't i didn't try and dig down and figure out uh who first came up with this concept of aliens with no noses 
in oh, today's day and age, like, like we could say fuck them both. To be honest, yeah, yeah exactly, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Uh, I would love, to, I would love if they just hired the same kind of like B plus corporate spy who just <laughs> stole his own work and sold it back to both companies. <laughs> yeah, I mean that's that's the ultimate ultimate karmic retribution, I think, for these. Yeah, movies, exactly. You know? And yes, fuck him, actually, Jamie. Yeah, Sorry, and fuck him. Yeah. I'll, I'll say it too. For good measure. I said yep. yes in agreement to Jamie, but I will also say yes, fuck them both. Uh, yeah. Games Workshop and Blizzard. In, in I don't even pay Blizzard anymore. I feel pretty good about that. Hell yeah. yeah. Hell yeah. yeah. Uh, so beside their striking similarities of protests from StarCraft, the crew are basically humans, but slightly alien, roughly the same size and shape. They have four-fingered hands instead of five-fingered hands. Oh, they're like the Samsons. Yeah, Gross. but they they put their pants on two feet at a time, and they have their olfactory organs in their mouth, just like us. Okay, they have oh. four hands with fingers on them. <laughs> no, four fingered, four fingered, four dash fingered space hands, not four space fingered dash hands. Okay, thank okay. you. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> they're, not, like they're not they're not Goro. Four arms with one finger on the on the end. Is that what you were imagining? <laughs> four <laughs> singularly yeah. fingered hands. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, i do i i said not like goro but i do think goro has four arms and i think he has three fingers on each hand he has three or four yeah oh, well, if it's four it's very confusing if it's three then it's distinct now he'd yeah. give good hugs though wouldn't he oh, yes he God. would before yeah. he ripped you in half before he tore and you said they have with... their their yeah. olfactory glands on the insides of their mouths in their <laughs> like mouths, a snake yeah. like a snake <laughs> i mean a taste is an olfactory organ right they they don't have they don't have noses so they're or taste is at least heavily tied like taste is heavily tied to smell when you lose your sense of okay. smell when your nose is blocked you don't taste food as well right um, what would a wine tasting be like at one of their vineyards so I mean that's the <laughs> thing they have their sense of smell all of it is just in their mouth rather than part of okay. it in their nose they breathe it in they, they breathe it in first and then uh, <gasps> yeah and then and then they like swish, swish it around <laughs> spit it out yeah Huff, anyway. huffing huffing a fine Here's wine like paint. Tones. <laughs> <laughs> uh physical size and shape may vary though their strongest cast the fire cast are slightly weak, weaker physically than the average strong human so uh in terms of of li put pick up heavy thing and put heavy thing down they're slightly weaker than humans but that's not typically how they fight, uh, which we'll, we'll get into in a bit. Uh, like I said before, only two female Tau have ever been illustrated. One of them... Were they too hot or not hot enough? Is for they where they taken out of canon? Not taken out of canon. Those two Tau are canon. So they are okay. they are considered, you know, uh, they're considered part of the canon. And they you can still look up those characters and, and they exist in the, in the canon. But why no? <laughs> we got our female characters right over here. Smash cut to a cardboard box in a dark corner. Smash Exa cut back. Like they're right there. <laughs> exactly. Exactly how it feels like. <laughs> uh, so the Tau only received limited close combat training because of their weaker physical status. They rely on primary long range, high powered weaponry and artillery. They are when you from from a gaming perspective, uh, and I guess for anyone who has, who does, is unfamiliar with uh, Warhammer or Warhammer 40k, it's tabletop gaming. So you have like little miniatures that you put on a table that you've made scenery out of. Um, they attack from the back of the board. You put them all at the back of on your side, and you just want them to shoot the enemies while the enemies are charging at them. The enemies like the orcs or certain space marine factions, the Tyranids who want to get in close and like tear you apart. The Tau basically have no or very, very few units who do that, who like getting close with swords and stuff <laughs> like that. So they just like a puffer fish have an airbag in case anyone gets close. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you made me ink. <laughs> they're, they're all they're all squids essentially, and they, they have like little ink ink glands which just uh, muddy the water essentially. Uh, yeah, I mean they do their best to avoid the, those grisly melees uh so many of the other races seem to just fucking love um they they they're like no thank you that's that's barbaric a lot of the new sister of battle units that got released recently are all melee units and i know they have like units i don't feel like painting so i never bought any like the arco flagellants are like prisoners with their arms and legs cut off and just replaced with electrical whips and shit <laughs> like that so and then obviously like everybody has a sword or, a, or like a chain sword or a power sword or something like that in the space marine chapters yeah I'm a I'm a particular fan of uh, flagellants because uh, a good friend of ours, a good friend of the show, Bobby Ferry, um, 
loves the flagellant faction in Warhammer Fantasy, Age of Sigmar. Yes. All, like Victor Saltspire in Vermintide is a flagellant who just like just crazy people who just like want to die in the name of the emperor essentially. Uh, yeah. Bobby uh, loves fun. to be flag- flatulent as well, so That's, it works that well. Is true, for that him. is true. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Got him. <laughs> so hey, he farts. <laughs> he does fart. He's a gassy boy. Uh, <laughs> unlike humans, the Tau have little to no connection to the warp. Uh, which we this is one thing that if you this is your first uh, Warhammer 40k episode, it's a, a hell dimension essentially. It's uh, when people say um, Event Horizon is canonically part of the Warhammer 40k fandom, which is a fun uh, conspiracy theory to look up. Um, what the Event Horizon crew finds, or when they what they what the crew finds when they get to the Event Horizon again. Um, is is the is the results of the warp that produce chaos space marines and all these other they just like add tongues to people essentially uh a lot of unnecessary yeah. tongues and teeth to people <laughs> uh, and then you have like a creature of the warp um, tongues and teeth head and shoulders needs to make a toothpaste and call it that <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh <laughs> i mean lord boy's oh, tongues and teeth prevents tooth dandruff duh Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you ever get flaky gums? Yeah, yeah dude. <laughs> flaky <laughs> gums. Like, oh sleeping with your mouth open, you got flaky gums. <laughs> um. So yeah, the the Tau have no connection to the warp from which Jamie and Peter will remember. Psychic powers come from a lot of other yeah. powers come from uh, the ability to travel faster than light comes from the warp because you travel through the warp. Um, you'll remember from the Tyranid episode, the warp only exists where there is life so um that's why like chaos space marines don't want to just kill everything they want to convert everything because they do need it like the the warp does need uh life to get around which is why the tyranids come from outside of the solar system where there's no warp why or i keep saying solar system outside of the galaxy uh where there's no warp there's no warp between galaxies essentially that's why we can't travel in the warhammer 40k uh universe why we can't travel outside of the milky way is because there's no warp to get there it, it will take hundreds of billions of years essentially to travel outside so um, um i wonder if you came across this in your research in regards to the warp uh and also and this is relevant because we've been joking about no women in 40k i know there's a female only faction of like people who guard the emperor which are the sisters of silence who are also detached from the warp are they pre or post tau or is it just unrelated they're probably pre just okay. based on, and we'll get into a bit, the Tau are very young. They, okay. they, they're an extremely young race, essentially. And again, they're not really a race. It's more of a dogma or a religion than anything. Right. But they're about 6,000 years old. So we are in the year 41,000, 41, roughly. We're around there. We're some, somewhere between 41,000 and 42,000 in Warhammer 40,000, <laughs> in Warhammer 40K. Right, yeah. Uh, I, I actually looked up today... What is the canonical year in Warhammer 40k? It turns out there's no way to know canonically. Like they lost track of time. The Imperium of Man, after the disappearance of the Emperor, or after the Emperor ascended to true godhood and became a golden statue on a throne, um, they lost track of time. And nobody really knows what exact canonical year it is. Um, there are people who keep track of things, but there's no way to tell which year it is. Kinda. We know. Go ahead. Sorry, it's kind of funny that the the like damsel in distress, the thing that always comes up in these like misogynistic things, the Sisters of Silence acronym is SOS. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sisters of Battle is SOB. That's <laughs> amazing. That was amazing. I was just thinking, as far as like time, like timekeeping, like forty thousand years of just like chalk lines, like four and one across on the wall. Yeah, you yeah. Know, <laughs> That's a lot of chalk lines. Uh, so yeah, the Tau don't have any connection to the warp, which means, um, they don't have any equivalent to human psychers who are like the wizards of the Imperium of Man who can control the warp, uh, warp based powers are out of their reach. They're largely unaware that the Immaterium even exists. Um, they made some attempts to study it, but they don't spend too long on it. Um, as a result, they tend to be in the in game in the, um, tabletop game they tend to be resistant to psychic attacks which affect the mind so like if you're trying to you know convince somebody that there's a you know chaos demon loose on the battlefield and that affects your troops that doesn't work on the tau so well because they don't believe it exists kind of they're kind of like the opposite of the orcs who 
uh, we did an episode on the orcs. It only works for the orcs. Uh, they believe in something enough, and it comes true because they are innately linked to the warp. That makes it true for them. Um, they will just in- innately believe that it's not true. That said, they have no defense against anything you do in the warp that changes things physically. If you if you have like warp powers which cause boils and pustules and tumors to appear on enemy soldiers, they are like uh, wheat wheat to the scythe. Um, okay. In in the face of that, essentially. Okay. They can never have psychic powers. Tau, no Tau have psychic powers, which we'll come back in a bit. But um, their spirits in the uh, in the warp uh, appear as ephemeral will o' wisps, whereas a a human will uh, a human soul will be like a bond. If you're in the warp and you're you're seeing a human soul, it's like a bonfire. It burns so bright, it's like uh, thermite going off. A a Tau you'll barely see. You can kind of see like a shimmering outline of the Tau soul in there, but they're just not linked to the warp in any kind of meaningful way. Okay. Do they have their own heaven? Did my pet Tau go to heaven or is he at that farm? <laughs> no. Uh, every Everything in the name of the Tau is in the name of the uh, Tau Va, the greater good. Uh, and right. they just believe that uh, if you do good on Earth, you did good. Kid. All right. <laughs> so I don't mind that. it's pretty good. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so like I said before, some research into the Immaterium has been conducted by the Tau. It was short-lived as they found, quote, the warp is no place for the greater good and is best left to those foolhardy races who cannot pull back from that terrible realm, end quote. Yeah. Oh, with all the pestilence and rape monsters in there, I think they're probably <laughs> right. <laughs> exactly. So they, they basically yeah. said like, hey, we don't have a strong connection to this. They figured out a way to get a connection to that. They looked, they, they looked at it for like 30 seconds and said, no, nah, that's fucked up. We're not gonna fuck with that. Okay? <laughs> yeah. Just forget about it. Forget about it. Just say, like take these, take these, uh, take this dossier and just throw it into the fucking ocean because nobody yeah. needs to see that. <laughs> of course, uh, we kind of brought it up when I when I briefed you guys, or rebriefed you guys on the warp. That the lack of access to the immaterium does have some implications in their ability to travel faster than light. Uh, something other races accomplish by hopping into the hell dimension is faster than light travel. Right, uh, you pop into the warp, you pop out of the warp at a distant planet. Who knows how much time has passed, but it's much quicker than light would have taken to get there. Yeah, they can't really jump in like other races do. They s- kind of skim over the edges of it with small jumps instead of one large jump. So they can't just <laughs> jump. They can't get to the other side of the galaxy in a heartbeat. They got to do like several jumps to get there, essentially. They have to bounce off the heads of these monsters. <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> the, he- the hell dimension is full of crocodiles with their mouths open, and you have to jump on the top <laughs> jaw to, to close the mouth as you skip across the river, essentially. Right, right, right. <laughs> uh, so these limitations with the warp do seem to color their interactions. They consider the forces of chaos uh, completely foreign to them and their understanding of the universe. Like I said before, they might look at other races as misguided or backwards, but they'll always try to establish an agreement with them before engaging in hostilities. So they do say like, hey, the greater good's the thing. Can we find a middle ground? Are you guys like working towards it? You know, is there a common ground here? Uh, The forces of chaos and the orcs from 40K are the exception, the only exceptions to this rule, where if they, if they encounter chaos space Marines, if they encounter the forces of chaos, if they encounter the orcs, they're like, you know what? We're just going to fight you because we know how it works. Which kind of implies they're still trying to uh, reason with the Tyranids, who are not forces of chaos. But, and we won't get into it in this episode, one of the earliest and greatest first conflicts for the Tau, the first conflict was uh, the Imperium of Man, was the first large-scale conflict with known factions from the 40k universe. The second one was the Tyranids, was a a big uh, invasion from High Fleet Gorgon. So I'm kind of surprised to hear that they are still trying to treat with the... or here by omission that they're still trying to treat with the Tyranid, but I do like it as a lore boys canon that they are still trying to reason with whatever hive minds show up of this like nameless hunger who are the Tyranids. Uh, and they're just like, no, these guys are probably okay. They don't deal with the warp either, you know? So they're, they're like us. Kong. What's that? <laughs> it's like King Kong. You've got like the other female, the other female Tao who's just like, no, stop. I can reason with him. Yeah, yeah. It's just like, it's like a hive tyrant. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> just a carnifex oh. crushing, crushing a Tao in its grip. Like, yeah. <laughs> but I was also thinking like, 
obviously they can't reason with any of any of the things in the warp because it's just like oh hello mr nurgle like what do you bring to the greater good is like i was hoping to make that guy over there erupt into termites maybe forever like okay how does that help us <laughs> how, how does that help the greater good my friend <laughs> yeah, I, I can make the wood in the house a lot weaker <laughs> it scares people so so the tau were not always so high and mighty of course all things considered, like I said before, they're a relatively juvenile race. When the Imperium of Man first encountered the Tau 6,000-ish years ago, around the year 3,500, or 35,000, excuse me, the Tau were noted to be at, at about a Stone Age level of technology. So they are okay. just discovering fire when man first discovers them in 35,000. They're not that far behind us now, if you think about like us with our tools and our current like homo sapien is like 20, about six, 30, years about six thousand years but we are nowhere near on uh, like they were like six thousand ish years ago we were stone stone age right yeah yeah, yeah. but in modern day 40k they are kind of like faster than light level technology like they are leaps and bounds ahead of us where they have like an interstellar empire which humanity yeah, well, does not yeah, have. Exactly. <laughs> yeah exactly we're, we're working we're working on it. we're obviously. working on it but I, you yeah. might be underestimating how long it'll take us to get there i don't know <laughs> <laughs> no kidding but no i'm more i'm more i mean just like six thousand years ago if i saw two people banging rocks together i'd be like oh, I, I guess that kind of makes sense depending on where you are yeah uh so now we're gonna dive into the um history of the tau but before we do that i think we should Take a quick break. Uh, whether it's a sponsor break or another break, who knows? But let's take a quick break, huh? Hop back. Early in their history, the Tao was a culture which rose from various warring tribes. This was a time before the, their rulers emerged, known as the... Uh, this time was known as the Mon Tao, a word which literally translates to the terror. Eventually... Cities would rise amidst the various tribes, one of which would be known as Fiotan. A rival tribe would lay siege to Fiotan, and it was during this time the first of the Ethereals would appear. What are the Ethereals, Ethan? We'll get into it. The, the no, that's not important. The, We're skipping past that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wait, sorry. Did I did I bury the lead there? No. Uh, sorry. Ethereals? Don't worry about them. Uh, <laughs> no, I mean, they, they become the, the ruling class. We're going to get into the the quick history of the Tau. We're going to get into the caste system and then we're going to get into kind of uh, a bit of their, their structuring. I would love to do a follow-up episode to the Tau. Uh, so if you, if you guys have liked this episode so far, make sure to leave us a review saying that you guys liked it. Give us the five stars, uh, but also head to our discord and uh, you can request more of this. I have one chambered uh, to follow this up, which is actually kind of like real recorded history of them in the 40 K universe. You know, the battles that they've had with other people um but for now we're gonna we're gonna set the stage for the tau essentially um cool. so one tribe lays siege to this city which has sprouted up amidst these tribes and you guys might say tribes and cities i don't know like cities like or a cities fertile crescent in the middle east like when our civilization was kind of coming together it's comparable to uh because you had like the desert nomads and smaller tribes, and obviously like larger cities down in like what's it, Iran now, basically. Yeah, exactly. I'm I'm gonna ask you guys to remember one thing for me, and I know okay. we don't we don't do well with this traditionally, as Jamie squints at his TV. <laughs> <laughs> You're asking a lot, buddy, but I'll try. All right, <laughs> believe me, it's you and me. Peter's actually pretty good at this during the episode, remembering what the fuck we're talking about. But you and me, buddy, we we don't just do it. <laughs> So it's it's the city is called Fiotan, and Fiotan is spelled Fio apostrophe T A U N. So F I O apostrophe T A U N. That's all all I ask you guys to remember. When it comes up later, much 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 later, uh, I expect one of you guys to shout Eureka, essentially. Okay. And Wait, so what do we how have do to you know? spell that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was the name of fucking Eugene's kid he wasn't supposed to have. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Eureka. <laughs> Oh fuck! That's okay, so you are good at remembering stuff on the show, only if it's dumb eugenic shit. Apparently, uh, <laughs> okay. So that it, it itself, Fiotan is a city which people are laying siege to. This plains tribe is laying siege to this city of Fiotan. Okay. Uh, so the plains Tau wanted nothing less than the utter destruction of Fiotan. 
So despite negotiations attempted, the siege dragged on for five long years. They're the well, Mongols. I watched a thing about this recently, like the Mongols versus the Chinese. Just just like the Mongols, where the yeah. the Fiotan are the the Tao of Fiotan, the city, are are holding them off. While the thick walls and artillery could hold off the plains warriors, they could not hold off disease and starvation forever. So five years passes. Things are, are, are looking bleak. Things are looking grim or grim dark for them, um, where they they start to succumb to the, the forces of a five-year siege, essentially. Yeah. The defenders begin to weaken, and the, the siege begins to turn in favor of the attackers. As things look bleak for the city slickers, two mysterious Tau appear. The two Tau split up, one venturing into the camp of the Plains Warriors, and the other somehow making his way into the fortress. The newcomers, Are the planes warriors, just their, their like, uh, what do you call it, like, air force, oh, planes, planes warrior. Planes warriors. <laughs> <laughs> no, they probably have a shitty air force because they're colorblind or something, right? You can't fly properly. We will. That's okay. why all their, all their mechs have legs. <laughs> this this is a great question because the answer is canonically no. Okay. Oh, I I will. We will get into who the plane warriors are. These are the Plains Warriors, though, oh, okay? Yes. There's one! <laughs> we no. will get in... We, we, no, we will absolutely get into into who the Plain Warriors are. I have mentioned it earlier on this episode, but we will get oh, into who they are. That's, that's yeah, awesome. Because you would have to have, like, an Air Force cast that is, like, specifically bred to, like, whatever. They, they, they withstand G-forces, so they've got, like, inflatable... No, the, op- the, opposite, the opposite. You remember how they, they, don't, they don't do gravity because they just live on spaceships? But not in the Air Force. Well, you still have to fly around on a planet. Like, I'm talking about, like, they, in atmosphere. They get they get there, though. Okay? Okay. <laughs> so, uh, these two mysterious strangers appear. <laughs> one goes to the Plains Warriors. One goes to the, to the uh, Fortress. The newcomers exude an intangible yet undeniable air of authority. They were a presence that none of the warring Tau could deny. Within hours, the gates of Fiotan swing open, and the leader of the Plains Warriors agrees to parley so they're just like these two strangers show up walk to both camps within hours both camps are like you know what we're cool like gates are open come on in we're gonna chat about this okay once the two parties meet face to face the ethereals handled most of the negotiating (laughs) so it's they kind of split off go to these two factions they're like no, no, we're, don't worry. We'll bargain on your behalf. And then they get together and you see another guy in the same kind of uniform just there like, oh, hey, how's it going, Jim? And they shake hands and they say, <laughs> we're going to negotiate on their behalf as well, you know? Um, they, this is something I kind of knew about trivia-wise from like some of the lore I had absorbed in the past. So, But I didn't want to I didn't want to talk about it, so I'm glad we're getting into it now. Obviously, yeah. I didn't want to spoil anything from the episode in the first three minutes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't want to hear yours. How's this? Uh, no, so these these two figures uh, get together with the, the gathered groups, and they speak of how important peace and love and drugs are, uh, of the need for understanding uh, between each and every Tau. It was here that they first described the Tauva, uh, that principle of the greater good and the need for each and every Tau to work f- for it and towards the greater good. Their, their religion, basically. Exactly. The words, yeah. the words that they spoke carried power, and that same sovereignty as before, which which let them open the gates and gather the leader of the Plains Warriors to to speak in parlay. Their word was so innately absolute that if one of the Ethereals had asked them in that moment all to die in those moments to take their own lives, they would have done so unblinking. So there's something about how these people speak, how these Tau speak, that every other Tau, whether it's recognizes their the reason for their authority, recognizes their place at the hierarchy of the castes, or if it's brainwashing, we'll let you guys decide. Have right? you ever been yeah. so based that you saw something that would make <laughs> you kill yourself? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I, like, theory is someone who's never even heard about the Tau before today. Did they dip their toe into the warp and like do some evil magics and stuff and to take control? So we're, we're we're gonna get into that. And this is what I, I talked about at the top of the show, which was the uh, it's not officially canon, and they were too goody two shoes for a while, so the canon was kind of changed. Or 
the canon was kind of not changed, but like ratified maybe where it was just like, Hey, we didn't explicitly say this. So we're explicitly saying this other thing now. Um, <laughs> the Skaven were ratified too. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Very good. Um, so across the world, about at the same time, more and more of these figures emerge where they all come from. What signal did they act? Like I couldn't find any reference of what started the ethereals emerging from amidst the Tau race, but a, they, but a bunch the same of them do. Species they are the Protoss looking dudes. Okay. They're pro, they're Protoss looking dudes. You can tell them they have a diamond shaped ridge on their forehead, and that's like the only distinction from the traditional crew. Okay. I also couldn't find reference of an ethereal who wasn't crew. So I couldn't find okay. a reference. Like there's three main races, and then there's a in theory, infinite number of other races who could be Tau. I didn't find any examples in my admittedly cursory glance at the Tau uh, lore of other ones. Um, there might be a novel out there or a novella out there which depicts a human uh, ethereal or something of, of that nature. If not, and you want to write for Games Workshop, that's an interesting idea for a novel right there, right? So just okay. go go ahead and write it, dear listener. Um, you can have that. That one. That one's free. That you can one's have your free. IP taken down on our behalf. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Or get bought out by Games Workshop. Who knows which way it'll go? Yeah. Uh, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> um. All these. All these serials come out. The only distinction of them is this diamond-shaped ridge on their forehead. Uh, they all have the same message: harmony and cooperation amongst the Tau of the importance of working together. Just it's a it's an after-school special, uh, all across the Tau homeworld, just like, hey, we got to we gotta get our shit in line here. Um, and across the world, people people do fall in line. The, the, the Tau are, cannot deny the wisdom of the Ethereals or are being, like I said, completely mind-controlled by the Ethereals. One or the other, to, to pick your poison kind of thing. Yeah. The Tau quickly cauterize into one, of, into one before the incandescent presence of the Ethereals. And they turn their focus from war to science. So they were warring tribes. Now they're science tribes, essentially. Okay. Team Girl Squad. Science, science, science tribes. Science tribes, yeah. <laughs> like a bunch of like cavemen with like coconut beakers. Doing <laughs> Just a, a caveman with a stethoscope made of three halves of a coconut with a vine. Yeah. To to <laughs> tying them together. <laughs> Someone's like pouring like solutions into a bigger beaker and the other guy's like, oh, you got to wear your eye protection. So he puts two little loincloths yeah, over yeah. his eyes yeah. or something. When you say there pouring is- a... When you say pouring a solution into a bigger beaker, you mean pouring a solution into a pelican's mouth. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so finally, finally, you talk about goggles. There is a very, very old. I think the invention of the modern sunglasses were was invented in northern Canada by the Inuit, and it yeah. is like a it's a, it's like a rod of bone with a slit just carved through it just enough to see but it yeah. prevents you from getting snow blinded yeah exactly oh, that's cool which so for th- our- those would be the lab goggles like it's the same kind of tech level of ju- <laughs> using like bone technology right for our, yeah. for our for our listeners in uh warmer climes uh when uh, the ground is covered in snow and the sun is out it is blinding like yeah uh, you, you you need yeah. like why you see uh, snowboarders and the like wear ski goggles that are tinted it's because you literally it's brighter than the summer is the winter uh when the sun is out because snow's more reflective than grass yeah and that yeah. that is called the albedo factor not libido but albedo look it up yeah <laughs> my albedo is quite low these days i must say <laughs> yeah uh, this the the winter will do that to you, I guess. Lower <laughs> lower the uh, lowers the libido, uh, heightens the albedo, as they say. I think I'm probably hornier in the winter. Hornier in the winter? Wow, really? I'm a sunflower. Why? I no, this is, this, is this is interesting. This is interesting. Let's dig deep on yeah. this. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's it's cold outside, so you spend more time inside, more snuggling, and the snuggling is way better. I mean, even though I have AC, snuggling in the winter is still. <laughs> That's just how you keep your dick warm in the cold, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it it notches in like at a hot dog bun. You just yeah. like so <laughs> Baby, baby, my dick's about to fall off from frostbite. Do you mind? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so the Tao, having turned their focus from war to science, focus on rapidly developing their technology. Ultimately, they achieve faster than light capability the capacity i mean if we just cooperated we could probably do it we'd get there we would have gotten there decades ago if, I feel like <laughs> if, if war wasn't a thing 
The capacity for the Ethereals to control lesser Tau and to some extent other races, like I said before, is ill-defined. In the novel Fire Warrior by Simon Spurrier, it's stated that it's some psychic ability which allows it, which, like I mentioned before, is kind of contradicted by a lot of official Games Workshop publications, which say, um, and not to say that Fire Warrior by Simon Spurrier wasn't a Games Workshop official, officially uh, endorsed, but it wasn't, you know, published directly by them. Whereas a lot of the rule books say that they don't have access to the warp or what we understand in the canon as psychic abilities. They they can't do that. None of the none of them can do that. But in the novel Fire War, it's implied that it is. Maybe it's like a pheromone, like a love potion thing. Uh, Pete, Pete, a million points. You nailed it. Okay. So. Oh really? So some other theories. Are that the oh. <laughs> diamond-shaped forehead ridges presented on are present on the ethereals produce some sort of pheromone that make others more open to suggestion. Oh. Uh, so again, I couldn't find the official. Hey, this is what it is. Uh, anyway, anywhere. It's Axe body spray. It's <laughs> yeah, just it like is, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the theory that it's the, the theory that it's. Pheromones is corroborated by the presence of a surprisingly similar ridge present on something known as a coral, a Q apostrophe O R L. It's this insect monster from a completely different sector of 40k space who use their who have the same ridge, the same diamond shaped ridge on their forehead, and use those pheromones to exude a similar air of authority. It's basically like the queen has that ridge, and when she's making different different insect casts produces that i i i have no idea what the lore boys canon through line is on this but i'm sure that maybe for april fools one day i will do an entire just fucking theory craft of how the coral are related to the tau um because they have the same diamond ridge and apparently exude the same kind of air of authority on others but there's no other points but that i could find between the two if you're connecting if you're connecting the dots, it's like line or dot thirty three and dot thirty five are on different pages, and there's no sign of dot thirty four. Like it's just <laughs> gone. Okay, so you just no, it's like. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, the Tau have like four fingered arms, right? Uh-huh. Our limbs, and then the bugs have six non fingered limbs. So we're yep. kind of lost there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that yeah. doesn't make any sense at all. But each of those six fingered limbs has. A uh, factor of of twenty four, which is okay. Here we six go. Six times four. I, I've got it. <laughs> I've got I've got the cannon. I've got the lore boys cannon that we can use right now. We'll canonize the pheromone thing since I fucking guessed that, and it was <laughs> it's already there, so that's close. One of the missing primarchs was on the coral planet, and the emperor discovered him. You know, whatever, just like harvesting leaves with his mouth and bringing yep. them back to a big tunnel in the ground. As you do and as that's a primer. Why, that's why he was just like, no, not my son. I'm out of here. That's why <laughs> him and the cotton candy marines. The cotton candy marines, I was just going to say, yeah. <laughs> the right. ant farm marines and then or the alien ant farm. Alien ant farm marines. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, Darnell, put it in the wiki, please. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Um, no, so 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 this second theory does seem to be the more prevalent one. Okay. That that not necessarily that the coral are related to the Tau, although there is some speculation that they're somehow related for some reason. Maybe it was just like a lazy writer who is just like like the corporate spy who stole the idea of the <laughs> flat faced aliens from, from himself. Uh, himself. Uh, <laughs> maybe a lazy writer just stole the idea of a diamond shaped ridge on the forehead allowing you to control the rest of the species uh, yeah. from himself. Um, whatever it is, this does seem to be the more prevalent one. The more accepted one is that it's a pheromone or something like that. Something non-related to the warp, kind of like the Tyranid who again, do not use the warp in any way, but do communicate via a hive mind. So there are other means kind of to the same end. Yeah. Um, apparently this ex this second explanation that, Oh, well the coral do it comes up as a reaction to the community complaining that the Tau when first introduced, were too pure for the grimdark setting of 40k. So this is what I alluded to earlier, the uh, horny neckbeard saying, like, they're too goody two-shoes. Uh, you know, they, they gotta be they gotta be grimmer, they gotta be darker. So now it's like, instead of everybody just believing in the greater good and saying, like, hey, so, so this utopia is a good thing, we're all on even footing, 
ba ba ba. It's like, oh no, actually, it's mind control. That's the only way you can make people do it. So yeah, it's, they smell weird. You can't tell. If that's yeah, why you. It's yeah. So the the in canon explanation or the the games works explanation for it is no, it was just red scare essentially. Like, yeah. It's, uh, <laughs> it's uh, don't don't trust a kami, okay? Like it's it's bad if you if you believe you in that take kind out of, of shit. the crowd with the diamonds on their foreheads in suburbia. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They got a diamond on their forehead and a gold star on their jacket, huh? Oh, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> so as, as a result of this kind of Games Workshop ca- canonizing, uh, one of the Tau sub-races, the Vespid, which we talked about before, the insecto- more insectoid-looking race, are often depicted wearing a magneto-like metal helmet known as communion helms, which are marketed as <laughs> for communication purposes though they're actually used to strengthen the ethereal's ability to enforce their will upon the Vespid. So, it's like the Mormon underpants. It's like fire, Satan, and, 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 the, and the Coral is what it protects you from. <laughs> exactly. Uh, it's a, Are it's the Vespid a, allowed to drink coffee? I wonder. It, it's a chastity belt for your head, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's a <laughs> communion, communion helmet. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So, uh, like, it seems like it was kind of retconned at some point. I didn't dig it, dig deep into when exactly, but it does seem like it was retconned at some point that the ethereal, the ethereals are enforcing their will. And again, whether or not you believe that um, that will is a good thing, that will is a bad thing, enforcing that will is a good thing or a bad thing, uh, is up for debate. But uh, it does seem like they're enforcing their will on various Tau sub races, if not definitely the Crute as well, the Tau primary race. Um, and this, these helmets are, are considered canon, uh, not justification, but proof of that, if you will. Okay. The, I just Googled, uh, just for anybody who wanted to know what a Vespid looked like, like I did. I was very curious. Uh, they are a fucking nightmare. Um, <laughs> okay. They do kind of have a, a bee stinger, but they are just like a, like a, just a shell covered bug man with like a big dumb underbite. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Again, you can, you can get like Vespid units in your tau army essentially and they're yeah. they're canon that's the canon why they're there is because they're being mind controlled whether it's actually games workshop canon lore boys canon community canon fan canon some it's somewhere in that jumble of of uh, real canons our canon is free to use for anybody <laughs> if you want in yeah. any anything whatsoever when we become powerful enough we'll come for you but like for now it's all don't worry about it hey your what your wife tried to divorce you take the dog just tell her your marriage is Lord Boy's canon, and she legally can't. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> she can take the T-shirt canon. She can't take the Lord Boy's canon. <laughs> listen, listen, partner. Take a knee. Your job trying to fire you? Just tell them you working there is Lord Boy's canon. They can't <laughs> legally do it. You got a re- Sam Elliott commercial. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> Sometimes a man just needs to reference a podcast his friends probably ain't heard of yet. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly his HR department hasn't heard of. <laughs> Sometimes the HR wants to fire you because you've been saying offensive things in the office. You just tell them that's Lord Boy's Canada. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, Dodd or Ram. Ram. <laughs> yeah. Which of a truck. <laughs> so with, with control of the lesser races established and the ethereals at the top uh, they then decide to further divide their newly conquered people into subclasses so now we're going to get into the caste system of the Tau. yeah the caste system is a six by five matrix five casts de- designed to determine what one does and six ranks to signify how well they do it and that's every member of Tau society fits into that box essentially i want to be the best at the lowest i'm saying that now before before we even get into it but i want to be like the fucking biggest fish in the smallest pond no okay you could so be the- a project manager for a video game company that'd probably be pretty good <laughs> so there's there's five casts um and the top rank of each of those so the sixth rank of each of those is pretty much on par Oh, then oh, the, okay. the uh, of the fifth of the of the five. So there's of the of the five casts. There's four which are pretty much on par. The fifth cast is the ethereals, and theirs is objectively the most important. Okay. 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 So there's four casts which are mostly on par, and then there's six ranks to each cast. Got it. The fire cast, known as Shas. Is the military? I guess this is this is actually fun. Why don't you guys pick one that you would want to be in the most? Right? Uh, I'm okay. gonna I'm gonna guess and or hope that neither of you guys choose the fire cast. 
The fire cast known as Shas is the military might of the Tau. Uh, when you buy um, a Tau battle set, a, a unit, it's often fire warrior. Like fire warriors is the base unit because they are of the okay. fire cast of the Tau. You can't, or uh, I won't say can't, but most of the Tau miniatures that you buy, you can't really buy the other casts. You buy the fire cast because those are the warriors. And when you're playing Warhammer, you're playing army versus army, right? There's also a video game. There's an FPS called Fire Warrior that I have never played but have heard of, and I, that's it. Cool. Great aside, because I've never yeah. heard of them. No idea what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah. It's a video game. I think it's on GOG. Sure, yeah. Yeah. Um, raw Dog, not Raw Dog, but Blood Blood Dog McGraw is also a video game that I played on Windows DOS, I think. So look that one up too, I guess. <laughs> raw Dog, <laughs> raw dog McGraw. McGraw. <laughs> Matt, Mad Dog, Mad Eye McGraw. I don't know how. I, I used to play Bubble Bobble. I liked Bubble Bobble. Bubble Bobble, also a good video game. There we go. We've all yeah. got a reference just like old Petey. That's the one Sam Elliott gets called into HR is because he was calling, calling someone in the McGraw. office Raw Dog McGraw. He, he was calling someone in the office Raw Dog McGraw, or was he, and let me, let me propose this, was he re- insisting that everyone at the office calls him Raw Dog McGraw? Oh, I, yeah. yeah. I think Sam Elliott would be like, a, don't call me Sam Elliott, call me Raw Dog McGraw. <laughs> <laughs> and that's where his HR complaint comes from. That's so going the, into the pile here. <laughs> so the fire cast, known, known as Shas, and we'll get into uh, how these kind of names tie into their their names and the, the naming system of the town. Their descend, descendants, direct descendants of the Plains Warriors who once besieged that city that we talked about. If you find yourself okay. a hunking meathead with a penchant for long-range sniping uh, and you find yourself joining the cause of the greater good, expect you to find yourself assigned to the shots. So if Am you're, I a hunky meathead? You're, neither of you guys are, I don't think. So uh, I was going right. to say, to find, find the cast that belongs to you guys. I don't think either of you guys belong to the fire cast. Okay. The earth cast, known as Fio, which you may recognize, is the tradesman class. Laborers, technicians, artisans, scientists, and engineers all find themselves among the ranks of the FIO. They are credited with the rapid technological jumps the Tau have made in the 6,000 years that they've been major players in the game, essentially. Okay. Um, I will say, it is too late now, but I was expecting a Eureka there. You got- oh, that's true. <laughs> I, I, look at, I look at my note, and I was like, oh, yeah, that's that city that they laid siege to. Interesting. I, I do get it. And I didn't forget. I didn't remember yeah. what I was supposed to say. So the <laughs> it seems like the fire cast is descended from the Plains Warriors, and the, the, yeah. the Earth cast is descended from the... Or not descended from, but the people who built the city would eventually go on to become the Earth cast. Right. Okay. The city of Fiotan, they eventually go on to become... Because they were building cities in a time of tribes. So they go on to become the engineers, the scholars, the mathematicians, etc. Yeah, 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 okay. The water cast, known as poor, P-O-R, is for merchants. (laughs) Stupid poor people. The the poor class, yeah. (laughs) The poor class. And they're the the merchants. They're they're the professional beggars, basically. They're buskers and hucksters and shit. (laughs) Uh, they're the merchants and the diplomats, which is probably the more important one is the fact that they're the, <laughs> they're the ones when you're walking by in your mech suit, they start squeegeeing your, your visor. You're like, come on, man. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you're making it work. Whatever, whatever. <laughs> um, Here's so a couple of credits. <laughs> they're, they're those with the glibus tongues, not enchanted with the power of the ethereal musk organ, whatever, whatever that diamond ridge is. Um, the axe body spray thing yeah, yeah exactly the <laughs> those not enchanted with the power of axe body spray that would explain the lack of female tau as well yeah. as the presence of axe that controls their lives <laughs> I, I do love i i wrote the phrase ethereal musk organ uh earlier to, earlier today when i was finalizing this episode and i was looking at it today i, I was like it looks a lot like elon musk organ and i do expect that elon musk organs smell like axe body spray so i don't know why i don't know why that correlation happened in my brain but uh, <laughs> sure did. like if we dissected him you mean <laughs> maybe yeah if you cut him open <laughs> if you like embalmed him it wouldn't smell like formaldehyde it would smell like axe body spray you know what I mean? I was thinking formaldehyde if you opened him up. Like, he's just forever preserved for some reason. He's already he's anyway. pre-preserved. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so the water casts are the merchants and diplomats. They're tasked with seeking and mon- maintaining diplomatic relations with the other races within the Tau Empire, primarily. So, so again... Or would have been the guys who looked at the warp and were like, no, we're not going there, sort of thing. 
They would have. I mean, it's also like there's all these different races. There is a myriad of races within the Tau at this point. And again, okay. play, playable ones, there's three or four. Um, in like officially canonized ones, there's three or four. But you could say in your mind, like they uh, they made zebras Tau. You know, like zebras, <laughs> they're Tau now. Hyenas, they're Tau now. Uh, muskrats, Just one Tau now. One little Skaven is a Tau. Like one little, yeah, doesn't one little, fit in with the rest of them. One little lost Skaven is a Tau now. Uh-huh. Um, uh, these guys are primarily in charge of, uh, you know, embassy relations, diplomatic relations with these other like inner sphere Tau races. So like they are, there are human Tau and the water cast is primarily in charge of diplomatic relations with them. They do, okay. they do do it outside of the, uh, Tau sphere as well. Um, but it does kind of seem like the ethereals who we'll, we'll get into probably are the primary players in first contacts and like, Hey, we're going to set the, we're going to set the groundwork for this. We're going to exude some pheromones on you. And then I'm going to hand you off to my assistant, the water cast. Okay. Right. <laughs> That's so gross. Yeah. Have a seat. We'll be right with you. Like, here's your pheromones. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> guy's gonna put his forehead in your face really quick and then you can come into the office yeah, yeah that's yeah. it just uh right. let me do you mind if i rub your cheeks okay there you go okay <laughs> uh feels nice. the air cast known as core function as messengers and pilots the plane oh, warriors that we these are about. the plane warriors making up most of the tau navy they're s- taller more splendor more slender bodies excuse me with long skinny appendages and hollow bones apparently makes their lives in zero gravity starships and space stations easier. They are reluctant to ever descend to land as for most of them, their muscles and organs have atrophied to the point where doing so would mean injury and broken bone and quite often death. Okay. Their ancestors during the Mon Tau, which was the period of time before the ethereal showed up, uh, the terror, as I told you guys before, um, during that time, they had membranes stretching between their limbs, allowing them to ride on air currents. So they were l- kind of literal birds in some sense, where they would they had their limbs kind of had these membranes stretching more like a them. like a bat, which you should be familiar with at this point. I'm I'm semi familiar with bats. I will admit to you guys. I, yeah, I don't know if I told you guys, but the day that I left, I asked my brother to to stay in our house, and there was a bat in the house. Again? Yeah. Well, yeah, he he, and he's not a vegetarian like I am, so he just killed it. I was like, you know what? Dude? Oh fuck! <laughs> you know what, dude? Kind of thank you though. <laughs> like, <laughs> like I, how do you do it? Like, a, like the rock people's elbow down onto it? Yeah, or? Tennis racket. Yeah. I so oh. I I say I say I felt kind of thank you, but I had a a serious moment of melancholy today where I was just like, man. That bat was he just trapped in here for days? Didn't know how to get out. But I'm a big softy who's who's not prone to uh, death at all. It scares me. So uh, <laughs> as long as your brother ate the bat, then it's all fine, right? No, it's yeah. in my it's in my freezer waiting to go to the provincial health department. They're gonna call me tomorrow to uh, have someone come pick it up to test it for rabies. Is, oh is yeah, because like rabies bat. and fleas and shit. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> dude, you got crazy <laughs> shit in your freezer. <laughs> I have a dead bat in my freezer right now. <laughs> I remember going to your parents' place one time. There's just a bunch of horse cum in the freezer. There was always <laughs> there was always horse cum in the freezer at the Palmer Estate. Okay, <laughs> we were Dude, never lacking in horse cum. Horse farm. <laughs> there, we were we were never lacking in horse cum. Okay. Newly labeled, I hope. Uh, so finally, finally, moving away from horse cum, uh, <laughs> we got we got the daddy class, the ethereals. Their class is known as the Aun. Uh, they're the political and religious leaders of the Tau, which should be no surprise to you guys at this point. Yeah. Um, they resemble uh, they resemble fire and water casts. Uh, all the different casts do look different. Again, like long slender is the uh, core, the air class. The Fio, the earth class, are, are typically much shorter and much more stout, kind of like dwarves Buffer. almost. Yeah. Uh, the Aun resemble the fire and water casts who look kind of similar, but for that diamond shaped uh, ridge on their foreheads. Right. Okay. They are. What do the poor look like? The poor are the water casts. So they, they kind of look like fire okay. casts. They look like the, the protoss, just a, a okay. typical zealot. Essentially there's, there's some uh, differences. I didn't write them down because they were so small that I didn't think it. Yeah. Right. Um, the Aun, the ethereals are sometimes seen on the battlefield. 
though usually I, I don't think there's a playable class this is something that i could have easily looked up but i i didn't i i don't think there's any playable ethereals if there is there's probably one or two i think they're mostly uh fire or shots um when they're seen on the battlefield whether they're leaders or observers it's always difficult to determine so uh if if they're present on a battlefield it's usually just as a spiritual leader not as a any kind of military force so I did look it up. Pete to the rescue. Jamie pulling up the clip. There are at least six Damn. single uh, ethereal figurines. One of them is riding a silly looking like hover bike. And then the other guys are just kind of like, I don't know. Chilling. Blue aliens in robes with a scepter. Chilling. Yeah. Cool. Wizards, essentially. Yeah. It's probably what? one of those like single $75 figurines that Jamie was talking yeah, about. Yeah, exactly. Honestly. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. At least if not more. Yeah. Uh, so the current leader of the Ethereals, and therefore the Tau, is a town named Aunva, uh, Master of the Undying Spirit, and Auno of the Tau Empire. Auno is the um, the title of the Emperor, essentially. The, okay. the, the um, And we'll, we'll, now we're going to get into the ranks and why the Auno is considered the Emperor. Because again, the cast is the Aun, and there's a suffix... Uh, apostrophe O at the end of it. I would take the diplomat class uh, just as my life as an office worker and uh, like doodler sort of thing. Uh -huh. uh, I would definitely be a decent, uh, I don't know, like rep to send to some sort of like like 40k Star Trek embassy to yeah. blow yeah. mist in people's faces and control their minds. You know how to start your shirt is what you're saying. I guess. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't mind. I don't mind a little bit of blue collar uh yeah. tower work <laughs> i think i'd go fire or water probably water i think i'd, I'd be in the Richard. army or no sorry earth or water earth or water okay yeah. i'd either be the the stoutman or the merchant i think merchant actually for my role-playing uh future I, guess. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I would say i would say you're you're both pete you said blue collar but they're definitely the white collar uh, you probably said blue oh, collar because it's the water cast um but yeah they're they're definitely the white collar uh, ranks, I would have put you both there as well. I would like to think that I'd be the core, just the space faring one, because that sounds dope as hell to me, and I love the idea of flying and going to space. But um, gravity's a real problem for you. <laughs> gravity, I'm, I'm so I'm so freaking earthbound. I can't get out of it. <laughs> The, the worst part about flying like interplanetary flying though is like there's just not enough leg room and like the food's <laughs> yeah, not yeah, so yeah. great i'm not willing to pay for first class yeah <laughs> um so so we'll get we'll get into the ranks now uh the ranks of each cast essentially so uh there's there's f uh six of them uh sal uh s a apostrophe s a a l is the cadet or intern rank uh as i would call it it's, okay. given, it's given to a Tau as soon as they enter the service of their cast. So if we were humans and the Tau showed up and we three said, hey, we want to join as uh, we want to, the greater good, that sounds great. We're pretty, we're a pretty socialist podcast. So uh, we say, yeah, thumbs up to you. We, we yeah, would, give me some body spray right we now. would, we would enter as Sal rank essentially. Okay. La is the next rank. Uh, the first and for uh, first and lowest <laughs> true rank of Tau society. So you got to get past Sal <laughs> to become a true. Rank. Already, I could tell that they yeah. learned this from the Sound of Music. Yeah, I was gonna <laughs> say <"Rain laughs> me after this. <laughs> <laughs> Sal, a deer, a female deer. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, because like we've been broadcasting the Sound of Music for forty one thousand years at this point, so the signal reached the Tau when they were still in the Stone Age. Yeah. <laughs> so I guess what happened. <laughs> Yep. With that one. <laughs> so a a law is the next rank. A so a shas law, for example, shas meaning fire, uh, and law meaning the first rank. A shas law would be a fire warrior, whereas a fiel law would be a manual laborer, and a core law would be a red shirt on a tau warship. Essentially. Okay, right. So and like a poor law. Exactly. Okay. So so I would be I would be given what I I chose the core. Uh, cast, I would be a core sal, having joined the the navy. Uh, you two would be poor sals, as you know, a couple of poor sals, <laughs> if you will. Uh, yeah, exactly. Ha having joined the merchant class, better uh, cal sal on yeah. Netflix. <laughs> From there, it goes up. There's ui vre, and then l as the second highest tau rank. So ui and vre, I won't get into the spe specifics of them because it just kind of it's you're just we're just walking up at this point. Yeah. Uh, 
uh, L is the second highest Tau rank. Shas L are commanders. Core L are ship captains, and Fio L are engineers. Essentially, okay. Um, as a as a relative mark to our current society. Finally, are the O the highest Tau rank? Core O are fleet admirals. Poor O are ambassadors, and of course, the Aun O is the ethereal supreme. Right, Mister <laughs> Mister Pre- President, Mister Aun O. <laughs> Poor O sounds like you're trying to call someone poor, but you don't know how to speak Spanish properly. <laughs> <laughs> you're poor. Porro, huh? <laughs> Pero is dog, I think. Pero is dog, yeah. yeah. Pero is dog. Poquito is small. Your little poro would be poquito poro. If poro, oh, if nice. poro meant your little poor. My... <laughs> <That's right. laughs> well, poro is probably a Spanish word. It sounds right. Probably, yeah. Pollo is chicken. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, I love On chicken. the subject of Breaking Bad again. Now that we're talking about that all. universe. <laughs> I started typing Poro into my uh, browser, and it showed all the bad stuff, because it starts with P-O-R. <laughs> <laughs> Thank God we don't have speech on, huh? Yeah. Um, uh, oh, Poro in English is further from Latin. Okay. In English? No, so it's Spanish. Right? It's a de- detected. Uh, it just means you're detected. poor. It means you're yeah. poor, like you're on your face of your skin. Poro is like a, a small poor. Oh, I see. Oh, poro is joint from Spanish to English. Joint. Okay. Sure. I, I guess depending how. I, I just put P O R O. That's. Poor. I use two R's. Ah. Uh, yeah. Anyways. <laughs> <laughs> so, so these casts, if not their ranks, were kind of in place before the arrival of the Ethereals. Like I said, with the core. They were like a distinct spe- species of bird person before yeah. the ethereals showed up, right? Um, and they were kind of shoehorned into their respective roles in a lot of ways, where it's like, hey, you're bird people, you'd be good in spaceships. So we're just going to put you in space. You have hollow bones, we're going to put you in spaceships. Saves uh, on fuel. That shit's not cheap. Exactly. Um, it, 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 was, uh, it was convenient. Like I said, eventually the ethereals do ban interbreeding between the casts because. They have everything that they need to do what they need to do well. So they're just like, hey, no muddying the waters, essentially, which is uh, fucked up. <laughs> yeah. But despite the tyrant vibes you can draw from the ethereals, the Tau are still the canon's goodiest two shoes, uh, the most open and tolerant of the intelligent species in the 40k universe by a landslide. Humans, I don't even think, rank top three. Uh, yeah, you haven't mentioned heresy or. Uh... <laughs> You haven't said the word filthy a single time in this entire episode. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> yeah. I think these guys seem pretty all right. They do They do respect the lower ranks and other castes, and a Chasse would recognize the importance of a field law worker who assembled their battle suit. A, okay. a, a knight would be like, hey, a field law is in a, It's like, it is the socialist. It is still kind of the socialist utopia where it's like, you know what? The, the country couldn't run on, couldn't run without farmers, right? Um, with that in place, with the, the cast system finally in place, the Tau got to work expanding throughout the stars. They got their FTL drives. They have their cast system. They got everything they need. Through a series of five so-called sphere expansions, which are marked by military campaigns, they propagate throughout the universe. They take over worlds. Um, a couple water ambassadors go to a couple different worlds of the Imperium of Man and take them over completely. Worlds are colonized, conquered, and sometimes, if not often, just assimilated as the locals hear the ethereals and accept the greater good. Their expansion. About, uh, oh, sorry. Their expansion claims about twenty fully developed star systems called Seps in the Tau language, and those Seps contain hundreds of worlds. I don't know what these star systems look like per se, but uh, they get hundreds of worlds within the Tau dogma, essentially, which okay. is. Still relatively small in the scale of the galaxy, right? Uh, we're talking about hundreds of millions of stars, if not more. Um, but they've they've got they've carved out a little sector for themselves. As they continue to expand, they inevitably find themselves clashing with the unbending conviction of the Imperium of Man, which would be no surprise to anyone. <laughs> no, nope. that man is not willing to accept uh, other 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> be, be that other man or other not man. They're, or the, other idea yeah. or anything like that. The, Frankly, it's just, it's, it's just like, oh, yeah, this like completely harmless blue alien reached out slowly with its hand open and what looked like a smile on its face. And then we killed it and everything it looked like it. <laughs> yeah. Um, so the Damocles Golf Crusade, perhaps named for the eponymous sword, uh, with these two powers at opposition with the ever-present threat of the still darker forces of the 40k universe, um, gets kicked off, essentially. Damocles, uh, the sword of Damocles is a story of uh, a man, Damocles, who goes to Dionys- Dionysius the king and says, you got, your your life is great, dude. Can I, well, like, your life is great. And Dionysius says, hey, it's not it's not all great. Why don't you step up here? Uh, onto the throne. So uh, Damocles gets up on the throne. Dionysius says, "Okay, like you got all these, all this food, all this women, all this gold, whatever you want, you have it. But there is a sword tied by a horsehair above your head, which could break at any time and kill you. Which represents the ever-present threat of uh, other forces killing you. Which for the Tau and the humans uh, in a galaxy full of." I mean, horrible, horrible monsters. Uh, yeah. <laughs> there's, there's Tyranids, there's Orcs, there's the Forces of Chaos. There's this constant, ever-present threat of the sword above your head. And there are yeah. two... Oh, just like the human factions. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Probably a lot of horses, too, to get all that horse hair. Yeah, exactly. All those swords. Yeah. All the swords needed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> how many how many horse hairs to build a spaceship? Is it a question that philosophers have been uh, pondering for centuries? You got horse hair? No. <laughs> yeah, you, you have horse hairs in the freezer too, or what? Always, always. I got, I got horse, horse cum, bats, and horse hair, baby. That, that's it. <laughs> uh, so, members of the Tau Watercast established at some point trade agreements with Imperial Worlds on the frontier of Tau space. Alarmed by the threat of alien contamination, the Administratum readies, readies a totally chill and appropriate response. A crusade. The Damocles Crusade kicked off Hell about yeah. a century <laughs> later with human forces destroying several Tau settlements and cutting deep into their empire, the Tau Empire, that is. But for now, we'll put a pin in it and maybe talk more about Tau on a future episode. If you guys like the episode and you haven't left us a review, please do. If you haven't recommended it to your friends, then please do. If you've done both those things, kick back and relax, baby. Yeah. More, more Tau's coming someday. Just keep being there, and we'll keep doing these. That's how it's gone Send so it far. To Sam Elliott. I think he'd like this. One. <laughs> <laughs> Sam Elliott would love this podcast, especially us talking about... <laughs> what, what, what do we call Sam Elliott? Raw Dog McGraw. Raw Dog McGraw. <laughs> <laughs> we'll find the actual title of that while uh, Jamie kicks off with what he wanted to plug on today's episode. Uh, what I wanted to plug is my dog barking. Ice, woof. Oh, that was great. Uh, very quiet it's very quiet but uh uh, add me on steam j milk you'll find me and peter what do you got uh my nose started bleeding halfway through that episode that was awkward i managed to keep that under wraps thankfully um check out uh, at lore boys podcast on instagram check out the loreboys.com slash about to links to everything patreon merch more importantly important paramount discord get in there talk to us talk to other people listen to the show some of our friends as well from real life play with play games with people suggest lore whatever you want just get in there do yeah, it yeah i mean the the discord is a lot of fun um it's where we do most of our interaction honestly and i i wish we were more motivated to to all you people out there on twitter on facebook and all the other things but by god we're just not and we've tried Facebook's pretty low key twitter yeah Twitter, we've all abandoned. It was my job, and I said, you know what? For my own health, I'm not doing this. <laughs> yeah, Discord, exactly. I stopped doing that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, but the Discord is a, is a great place. Go to lowboys.com slash about, and you can find links to all our socials. Uh, again, the Twitter one, who knows if we're there. If you're, if you're a time traveler from one of our earlier episodes, we also don't have the URL uh, pornhubcaps.com. Uh, if you're... <laughs> Oh, if, that's true. We stopped that's what came that. up when I was trying to look up Poro, of course. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> if you're a new listener who's like, what the hell is pornhubcaps.com? Just go back and try and find it at our old episodes. Transformers right? episode. Oh, come on. You just got to spoil the search for him. 
Okay, yeah, it's a yeah. Farmers episode. Just go back. It uh, is. You can listen to it there. I got a cat climbing <laughs> on my chair right now. But for anyone who wants to support the show financially, we do have a Patreon. Uh, the biggest and uh, most girthy shout-outs to our patrons uh, at patreon.com slash the lore boys. You can just support us. We have a $1 tier. We have a $3 tier. Do we only have a do we have only have a three dollar tier? We might not have a one dollar tier. Anyway. Three nine fifteen and then a joke. We we got tiers, yeah. So uh, yeah. go go there, check them out. Anybody who does it already, thank you so much. You guys are the best. Anybody who's thinking about doing it, you're you're second best in my heart. This the day you do <laughs> the day you pull the trigger, you will be the best with the ranks of the other patrons. Um, no, it, it really means the world to us uh, that people are willing to uh, support us through this and, and cover just cover our costs really is is the big thing because we do enjoy doing it. Um, and we do have Lore Boys Prime, which, uh, of course, we've, we've offered long, long before we ever offered uh, anything else. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> sorry, I'm getting attacked by a kitten right now. Get off of me. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and of course, we are uh, pushing our dogma this week, as we do every week. The greater good, the uh, lore, lore boy, lore boy vasa, uh, as it's called, uh, the principle that uh, anything you do, or will do, or should do, should will give you horse cum in the end. Will give you horse cum. <laughs> which is to say that it should benefit the lore boys, because anything that gets you horse cum. Will benefit the lore boys because this week we are trading our lore boys prime subscriptions for uh, the sale of horse cum. As Jamie mentioned earlier on the show, my freezers are full. I got dead bats and I got horse cum and I got a bit. I got a bit of horse hair, but honestly, my supplies of horse hair are running kind of thin. So I'm giving yeah. away dead bats and horse cum on this this week's lore boys prime. Make sure to get in there, sign up for the subscription, uh, subscribe oh, to the God. dogma. And horse cum will come your way, my friend. Or you maybe- better live close because it's gonna defrost fast, my dear. Yeah. <laughs> maybe maybe it'll be horse cum. Maybe it'll be a dead bat. You just gotta close your eyes and hope for horse cum. Okay, my friend. As, as soon as it's cleared and healthy, that frozen bat's gonna be great. You can just have it. Yeah, like yeah. Seventh yeah. Co- seventh collar in. A, it can a, get get have the frozen bat. A batsicle. <laughs> I mean, it's it's beautiful. Like, it's not freezer burned. I promise. It's fresh fresh in the freezer. Uh, and just just sign up for low roast premium, and that, and you'll you'll get those as soon as they become available. Uh, Do you put it in a bag, or is it just sitting in there? Uh, it's in a bag. It's in a okay. Bag. Oh, yeah, Duck. at least all all, all bats guaranteed to be ziploc shut or duct tape yeah. shut in a ziploc bag. And I think <laughs> I think that <laughs> would constitute. <laughs> Just can't figure out how to close these dang things. I think that would constitute a lore boy. Lore boys. Goodbye. Out. Out. Weird. I had to reset my microphone. Jamie, you want to say something? Ah. Oh yeah, that picks that picks up. It's a nice looking waveform, my friend. My name's Ethan. If I was gonna sleep in any kind of bed, it would be a llama bed because I assume that they know comfort because they're ornery bastards. Um, if I was to sleep in a bed, it would be a bed made of dogs' ears because they're so soft. Those are the softest part of a dog, biologically yeah. speaking. Uh, if I were to sleep in a bed, uh, my name is Peter. Uh, I would do it at the like, like, like delicately cloud soft under fur that you brush out of a cat. Okay, you know yeah. when you like roll it out of the little metal hooks, it's like lighter than air. Basically, we're really proving that Jamie is the dog person and Pete's the uh, cat person, and Ethan's the llama person on this. <laughs> <soundtrack>. <laughs> you, you were you've been an alpaca man since birth, dude. Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> don't go call it alpacas llamas, my guy. Okay, extremely offensive. Look, they're the same. I'm okay with people's pronouns <laughs> and, like, whatever. All the members of LGBT, I will adapt, but llamas and alpacas are the same thing, and I don't care if my children think I'm bigoted because of that. All, all alpacas look alike. That's what you're saying, huh? That's what you're yeah. freaking saying. All, yeah. all camelids are the same. All camelids look alike, huh? Hey, that, yeah, exactly. Joe Biden's shipping in llamas to vote for him and steal <laughs> the fucking election. <laughs> One of us did have to Google what the family, the animal family for llama was during the sound. I was wondering how you knew that, actually. <laughs> I was like, he must have typed it's it out. Quick, yeah. quick Google, quick Google. But we'll see yeah. if the keyboard picks up during this. Huh? It's 742. Do you know where your children are? Recording a podcast, yeah. maybe. If you're Hopefully our not parents. Listening.
Yeah. In my sack. In your sack. Hopefully not listening That's, to I'm podcasts not letting... with cursing. Yeah, my kids are grounded forever. They got to stay in my balls until I die. <laughs> uh, you're, you're like a precog. You <laughs> come from Minority Report where you yeah. predicted their crimes. <laughs> yeah. One of my kids is going to try and kiss a girl before he's 18. He's grounded. I don't mister. think so. No. <laughs> my fucking watch. Yeah. <laughs> 